often have students who sat in the back of the classroom. And I would tell them that that made it difficult for them and me to give the class. And so one day I went into the classroom and a lot of the students are sitting in the very last row. But unfortunately for them, there were also blackboards at the back of the classroom. And so I went to the back of the classroom and started teaching and they had to turn their chairs around and of course they were in the very front row. So for those of you that are sitting in the back of the room, hoping that you'll escape my attention, you're wrong. <laughs> Hello, my name is John Mad Dog Hall and I'm the executive director of Linux International, the chairman of the board of directors for the Linux Professional Institute the co-founder of Project Caninus Lucas, the president of Project Kawa, and in my spare time, I'm the chief executive officer for Optin, the company that makes open source peer-to-peer -peer cloud software. This talk is not about any of those things. This talk about is about Unix and Linux and free software and why Unix and Linux were interesting and how it changed the computing community. Now this is being done from my memory and I am close to 68 years old. I've had two major heart attacks. I only have 37 percent of my heart muscle left and my memory is not as good as it used to be. So please, those people who say, oh that's not the way it was, I remember that. Well, first of all, you're probably wrong. <laughs> and number two, you're welcome to do your side of it in your talk someday, okay? And I know that some of it's incomplete because we only have an hour to talk about this. So if you're going to have any problems with any of these things, you can leave now. It's okay. So first, we're going to go way back in time, way, way back in time to the first mention of Unix ever. And it was actually in Istanbul, Turkey in the year 1453, where Unix were used to guard the harem of Medved the Conqueror. Only they spelled it differently. They spelled it E-N-U-C-H. And they had white Unix and black Unix guarding the harem. Oh, wait a minute, that was a different Unix. Never mind. <laughs> and a lot of people think that free software and open source distribution of software is a new thing. But it isn't. Because in the years of 1943, when the, moder the, the modern age of computing started, with computers such as the Mark I, the Mark II, and other, the Zeus over in Germany, there weren't enough of these machines to really justify creating a binary distribution. And even as they started to be produced in larger numbers, there were so many people making so many computers of different architectures, and they cost so much money so that most people could not afford them, it still did not make any sense to create a binary distribution of your code for any particular product. And the way that you actually bought a product back in those days, let's say a compiler, this was back around, say, 1973, is that you would negotiate with a company as to how much you were going to pay for that compiler. And when I say pay, you know, negotiate with a company, it might take months of negotiations to say, Yes, I want to buy a copy of your compiler, and I want to put it on this type of computer. How much am I going to pay you for that? And the answer might be 100,000 US dollars in 1973. In 1973, 100,000 US dollars could buy three homes. And if you negotiated with that, you signed a contract with that company. And 
that contract said what you could do with that software, how many machines you could put it on, how many people could use it at one time, and so forth and so on. And you signed that contract, and then they gave you the software. Or rather, a large magnetic tape showed up at your company. It was attached to an engineer. And that engineer would sit there in your company trying to get that tape, the code on that tape, to compile and run a set of test suites to make sure that it worked the way it was supposed to. And after they spent a week at your company doing this, you would look at the results of the test suites and you would sign the contract and say, yes, this actually did what it was supposed to. And then you would say, of course you're going to leave the source code for that with us because you had purchased that code. And sometimes they would say, well, we don't want to leave our code with you. But if you were a big enough company, like the one I used to work for, Aetna Life and Casualty, the largest commercial user of IBM equipment in the free world, a company that had a three-acre computer center back in 1973, with 4,000 programmers writing code for them, who automatically ordered two of everything that IBM announced. If you wanted to do business with that life and casualty, you would leave their source code with them. Or you would put it into escrow in a law firm that if your company went out of business, Aetna would get your source code. And that was the way we did business in 1973. Now, a lot of people think that operating systems back in those days were created with different sets of interfaces in order to lock the customers in. How many of you have ever heard that? Oh, the, 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 the company is trying to lock you in, right? Lock you in, yeah. I was there. We never talked about that. What we talked about was the fact that we were going to create an operating system that worked on this incredibly expensive, incredibly slow, with an incredibly small memory system that physically was so big you could actually walk inside of it. And that you had to put it into a place that had a raised floor because that's where the water pipes are going to go to cool it off. Right? And when I say incredibly small memory, a mainframe computer that would have one quarter of a megabyte of memory. And you were supposed to do some programs with that. I mean, I know bootloaders these days that take up more room than a quarter of a megabyte of memory. And these operating systems were to do a specific thing. You'd have an operating system that did batch type of code using punch cards or things like that. You had another operating system that would do time sharing. You'd have another operating system that could do real time. You'd have another operating system that was geared towards educational use and so forth because you were trying to give your customers something to make their job easier. And the thought of locking in customers it was never discussed, at least amongst the engineering people. Maybe some marketing person someplace had this weird idea, oh, we can lock in the customers. And then the engineers would slap them across the face and they'd be gone. <laughs> in fact, our engineers would talk a lot of times with the other engineers of other companies, sharing ideas and things like that because they just wanted to give their customers a better system. And as far as embedded systems, there was no such thing as embedded systems. When I started programming, a single transistor would cost $1.50. If it was a power transistor, it was $2.50. And 
And there was no such thing as an integrated circuit. In fact, some of the first computers I ever programmed on used vacuum tubes to do their logic. So we were all about trying to give a more efficient system. And if it was true that we were just trying to lock our customers into using our hardware and our software, then the PDP-11 would only need one operating system on it, when in reality, the PDP-11 had 12 operating systems. RT-11, RS RSX-11, Vistas, IAS, Unix, several different types, all these different systems ran on this one piece of hardware from DEC because we were trying to give our customers the best system. Now, in 1969, there was free software. I know because I took advantage of it. I was a college student and did software for my little PDP-8 computer system. Now, as I said, back in those days, a compiler, a commercial compiler, might cost 100,000 US dollars. And I'll tell you, as a college student, I did not have 100,000 US dollars. So I joined a group called DECAS, the Digital Equipment Corporation User Society. And there were other ones. IBM had Share, Novell had Brainstorm, and so forth. And you could go to these, co these organizations and you could, give, you could pay $15 and get a paper catalog of programs for different operating systems that you could then buy for the cost of copying. Five US dollars would get you a text editor on paper tape, and $15 would get you an assembler because it was a much longer paper tape. And you would look through the catalog, you pick out the programs you want, and you would order them. Now in 1969, $5 was a lot of money for a college student because $5 would buy you 10 pitchers of beer. And so you had this choice, text editor or 10 pitchers of beer. And I think you can see the direction I would normally go. Now, the thing was that this was free software. In fact, in 1969, you could not copyright software. You could not copyright a binary distribution. You could not patent software. This was way later, this came about. And so once you got that paper tape, you could go to the school store, buy fresh paper tape, and then make copies of it and sell it to your roommates for $1 a piece. And after I'd made 10 copies, I both had my text editor and I had my 10 pitchers of beer. And so I was one of the first Red Hat companies making copies of this. Now, where did this software come from? It came from people who needed the software for their own business, for their own use. Back in those days, you could not get a computer science degree. As a matter of fact, there was no computer science. There was only computer black magic. And if you were involved with computers, you belonged to the chemistry department, or the math department, or the electrical engineering department, and you were writing programs to help you with your chemistry, to help you with your electrical engineering, to help you with whatever you were doing. I had a professor who came to me in my last year of university and said, John? They didn't call me Mad Dog then. John, you will never be able to make a, a living as a professional programmer. And 50 years later, I'm still trying to find out if he was right. So in any case, these people wrote these programs for their own use and then said, what am I going to do with it? Should I sell it? Should I try and sell it? Well, let me tell you something. After 50 years, I can tell you that selling software is really hard. 
you have to advertise it, you have to support it, you have to write good documentation for it, you have to you know, fix bugs for it, all these things. And these people were not in the business of writing software. They were physicists and chemists and electrical engineers. That was their business. And so they contributed their software to DECAS in the hopes that somebody else might be able to use it. And once it was in DECAS and people ordered it, then maybe these people went to a DECAS meeting. And we had them twice a year, and there were local DECAS groups. And once they got there, somebody would say, you're the person that wrote that good assembler. Oh, man, that really helped me out. Hey, I have some, some ideas for it. Can I, can I give you some code? Oh, yes, that's nice. Oh, you're the person that wrote that, that editor. Oh, that was really a great editor. Let me buy you a beer. Let me buy you dinner. Let me give you a job. And all of these, of course, are reasons why we write free software today. We need it for our own use. It helps other people. Maybe we can get some, a job out of it, or at least a beer. Now, next year is a very important year. It's a very unusual year. Because in 1969, 50 years ago, two people, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, at Bell Laboratories in New Jersey, decided that they were going to write an operating system just for fun. Now, Ken Thompson had been with a, with a, a project called Multics. And Multics was supposed to be the be-all, end-all operating system for thing. Multics, multiple, multiple ticks, right? But Ken was taken off of that project, came back to Bell Labs, and he was really disturbed because he liked the idea of writing an operating system. And so they found a cast-off PDP-7 computer out in the hallway because even in those days, even though the computer was relatively new, computer engineering was moving forward so fast that the PDP-7 was obsolete. And they said, can we use this? Yes, go ahead. They were a research organization. They weren't expected to make anything. Pure research is just to find out things. And the PDP-7 had an ASR33 teletype, which read or punched paper tape at the rate of basically five bytes a second. Now think about this. If your program is 3,000 characters long at the rate of five characters a second, it takes a long time to punch that out, okay? or print it out, as the case may be. The memories of these computers are measured in thousands of bytes, not megabytes, not gigabytes. I remember the first time I was at Digital Equipment Corporation and somebody said, oh, that disk drive is five gigabytes. I said, what's that? Because you know, I knew what a megabyte was, or a kilobyte, but a gigabyte? That was hard for me to fathom. And the cost was reasonable for the PDP-7. So they started to write the system. Now, could not assemble their system because it was done in, it was done in uh, assembly language, machine language. They could not assemble their system on the PDP-7 because it didn't have enough memory. So they had to go to another computer and do a cross assembly, punch it on the paper tape, take it to the PDP-7, load it on the PDP-7, and then try and run it. And if it didn't work, they could single step through memory using the lights on the front of the PDP-7 to figure out where their code was going wrong. Then they would go back to the first computer, change the, change the assembly language, repunch the tape, and try again. Now, Unix, as an operating system, has some certain differences. And maybe they planned this, or maybe they didn't plan this. Who knows what went through their minds as they devised this system. But Unix was written with such a small kernel, and the ability to make it 
portable, that eventually it was the same operating system going across multiple different hardware platforms. Now, as I said before, in those days, the operating system was tightly coupled to the architecture of the machine. And, and because of that, as you went from machine to machine, you had to learn new commands, you know, whole new things as you went from different architectures. Unix, for the first time, was the same operating system across multiple architectures. But this didn't come easily because the PDP-7 rapidly ran out of capability. And Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie wanted to get a new computer called a PDP-11 from digital. But they couldn't just borrow one. This is one they would have to pay for. And their department refused to buy them a computer system just so they could play with it. So they went to the only department at Bell Laboratories that had unlimited money. Money, just, it was just flowed like water to this department. And they convinced the people in this department that they could make a, an operating system to allow them to do their work a lot easier. And so this department gave them the money for the PDP-11. What department was this? Central engineering? Nah. Business administration? Nah. The legal department. And this explains why so much of the commands in Unix are character oriented. It explains why one of the first major subsystems on Unix was NROF for formatting a document, and then TROF for photo typesetting the document, because the lawyers wanted this to do their legal briefs. And I'm going to paint this picture in your mind of a lawyer sitting down to an ASR33 teletype, typing in their, their brief, using a text editor that's not Vim or VI, not Emacs, it's not even ED. It is a text editor that has an invisible dot that you have to keep in your mind as you move it around. A lawyer learning how to make this system work. And that's what a new invention that came out called the legal secretary, who did all this work and turned it over to the lawyers. But in any case, that's where the money came from for the first PDP-11 that Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie made. And what they did, as they, they, so the first port from the PDP-7 to the PDP-11, they had to rewrite the entire kernel in PDP-11 assembler language. Because the assembler language of the PDP-7 was completely different from the assembly language of the PDP-11. And so they rewrote it. And Dennis Ritchie said, that was a lot of work. This is crazy. I'm going to invent a language that we can rewrite the kernel, and then we never have to rewrite it again. And so he invented this language called C. And they rewrote the kernel in C. And they said, we never have to do that again. But then they ported it to a new PDP-11 that had a different structure. And all of a sudden, they realized our kernel is not portable. Our kernel is written to the architecture of the PDP-11, even though the instruction set is now generated by the compiler. We have to separate out the things that are the same in every operating system, that we, every hardware architecture we go to, S scheduling a task, you know, scheduling memory, from the device-dependent parts that are going to be different from every system device drivers, the actual touching the actual hardware. And that's where Unix became, started to become portable. Now this was incredibly important because it also allowed humans to become portable. 
across hardware architectures. The same operating system, the same commands across all of them. Now, there were other things that were, happened in 1969 that were kind of important. People walked on the moon. Big thing, man. Moon's great. A lot of the work of putting somebody on the moon was done with slide rules and books of tables, believe it or not, hand calculators, things like that. A wonderful movie, Hidden Figures. If you've never seen it, please do. Uh, the ARPANET, the beginnings of the internet, was started. And it had a 15-bit address space. Yay! Because there are only going to be a certain number of systems talking to each other. How could you possibly have billions of systems, billions of computers out there who needed a unique address? Linus Torvalds was born. Yes, next year Linus will be 50 years old. I feel incredibly ancient because I knew him when he was a 21-year-old college student. And I wrote my first program in 1969. It was written in Fortran. All capital letters, please. It's not Fortran 2, Fortran 4, Fortran 77, Fortran 90, High Performance Fortran. None of those. It was just Fortran because why would you need any other language? I hadn't heard about C yet. And I was using punch cards. Everything was cool. And one more thing happened in 1969. It was the last time I ever shaved. <laughs> and for 30 years, my mother would say, are you ever going to shave, no, ma? And then she stopped saying it. And about two years before she died, she said, you're never going to shave, are you? I said, no, ma. And then she died. Somehow I feel sad about that. But that was the last reason why I would ever shave, so I'm never going to shave. Now, past that point, you started to spread. Ken Thompson loved teaching in universities, and he would go on sabbatical for Bell Labs, and he would go to these universities, and he would take along his favorite tape of his favorite operating system and use that to teach operating system classes. He reveled in this. And one of the places he went was the University of California, Berkeley. And he taught out there for a number of years, on and off. Now, people often think Unix was free. No, it wasn't. If you were a research university, like University of California, Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Stanford University, you could get a site-wide license for Unix with the, source, with the source code for 350 US dollars. But if you were Hartford State Technical College, just trying to teach people a little bit about data processing, and you wanted to show them how to use Unix, it was $160,000 per CPU. And that just got you the license from AT&T. The other thing was you had to find a person inside of AT&T to tell them your serial number of your computer. Now, how many of you know the serial number of your laptop? Or your, your TV at home, the smart TV. You know the serial number of that, right? You got it right on the tip of your tongue. No. We had to tell them. And if that computer broke, we had to take, we had to call that person up again, and they probably had changed jobs by then. We had to call them up again and tell them the serial number of the new computer before we could move the code. And if you wanted to put it on two computers, it was another $160,000 and another serial number. A third computer, another $160,000 and another serial number. Because this was a telephone company, they didn't understand volume discounts. But then what happened was a company called Sun Microsystems had invented a new little desktop computer using a Motorola chip, something developed at Stanford University as a project, and they needed an operating system for it. CPM was not good enough, too simple, not powerful enough. They went to Digital Equipment Corporation and asked for our VMS operating system, and we kind of laughed at them. But then a guy named Bill Joy had been working at the University of California, Berkeley, and said, why don't we use 
Berkeley Unix. And Sun Microsystems went to AT&T and said, if we only distribute this as a binary license, not source code, could you give us a different license price? And AT&T said, yes, you could pay $350 per system, and you don't have to tell us what the serial number is. Now, $350 still sounds like a lot of money, right? But it was because it was going to go on a piece of hardware that was going to sell for $150,000. So $350 was noise in the wind. And this allowed you to have three people logging into the system at one time. Actually, I'm sorry, $350 was actually unlimited number of people. But if you only wanted to have three people logging in, it was only $150. Now, why would you need three people in a personal system? Well, one person might be logged in as the user. One person might be logged in as root, systems administrator, super user. And the third person logging in was UUCP, Unix to Unix copy which was the networking that was allowed in Unix systems back in those days. And Unix to Unix copy, you wanted to copy a file to another system, you would say, send this file over that system, and your computer would actually dial up on a modem. <laughs> and then transfer the file at the amazing rate of 110 characters a second. But that was okay, because we were only sending ASCII files there, not MPEG-3s or videos or anything like that. So that, that speed could do it. But that only got it to the next computer, because this was a store and forward system. And you might have to put five or six computer names in a line separated by exclamation points, which we called bang. Whole shaman, exclamation point. Shaman, bang, deck backs, bang, hall would get it to me. Now, all the people using Unix at this point were used to using source code, because they were universities, people who had source code license already. And we would go to these meetings every year called Usenix meetings, where we would talk about great things with Unix, exchanging ideas, so forth. And that was OK, because we all had source code licenses. And then one day, we had a Usenix meeting, and somebody from my son Microsystems stood up, talked about all the things that they had been doing. Everybody said, this is a great thing. You know, let's go to the machine room. Let's exchange the code. And Sun said, no, because we are only distributing binaries of this, and we are not going to distribute the source code. And everybody in the Usenix audience went, boo, ooh, boo, just like in Princess Bride. <laughs> but over the years, more and more companies, Dell, Hewlett Packard, IBM, also started creating binary only distributions, also started coming to the meetings, talking about what they did, but not sharing the code. And this became more of the norm. And the people in the audience who are less and less booing and hissing and more and more acceptance of this. Now, this created some other problems. This caused, started to cause fragmentation amongst the Unix systems. Remember I said how Unix was so great because you have the same commands, the same operating system across all this hardware? These Binary-only systems from these different vendors started to differentiate, started to be different. And, you, and, and, the, and the things that would work on one system would not work on the other systems. And each one of them called it a different name. Digital's was Ultrix. IBM's was AIX. Sun's was Sun OS. And so customers, when they went out there, said, I want Unix. And they couldn't understand why they couldn't find Unix. They just found these other things that everybody said was Unix, but it wasn't. And this created some real wars in the Unix communities. One group called was called USL, and that was made up of Sun and AT&T 
and they wanted to have a System 5 interface. And the other group is called the Open Software Foundation, also OSF. And they created, this is made up of Hewlett Packard, Digital Equipment Corporation, IBM, basically everybody except Sun and AT&T. And there were big wars in between going on, which caused a lot of hardship in the industry. At the same time, 1977 to 1983, the beginning of shrink wrap software started to come out because in that time frame, the, mic the microcomputer came out. The Atari, you know, some of the Radio Shack computers, things like that that could run operating systems like CPM. And they started, and MS-DOS, the early versions of MS-DOS. And people started to create computers like cookie cutters and cookies. Why can't we do software the same way? And it was during this time that the concept of you buying the software changed to you renting the software. And your end user license was created that if you just used the software one time, you agreed to that, even if you've never read it. Likewise, your warranty was there. That was worthless or worthless. And at first, hobbyists tried to keep these, the open source software flowing. They had bulletin boards and things like that that you could copy it down. But eventually, a lot of that disappeared too. Now, of course, there was one person at MIT in 1984 who objected to this. His name was Richard Stallman. He was a student at MIT, and he was responsible for keeping Unix systems going and everything. And one day, he got this Unix system where he was expecting source code, he got only binary. And he was trying to make a printer work, and he couldn't do it, and he couldn't see how the code worked. And this so infuriated him that he decided to start a project called GNU. It stands for GNU is not Unix. And then later on, he formed an organization called the Free Software Foundation to try and promote this with other things. And he wanted to create an entire operating system that was available in source code form. And he started with this program called Emacs. And some people say that he could have stopped with Emacs because Emacs is basically an operating system. Schedules memory, schedules tasks, things like that. But he went on and he created a compiler suite called the GNU suite. And even though the GNU suite was not as efficient, it didn't generate as efficient code. It had this one advantage over the other compiler suites. And that was the fact that it used the same syntax and semantics for each language, no matter what hardware you were on. And that meant that the number of if defs that you could have in your source code because you weren't using DEC C compiler or Hewlett Packard C compiler or all these, you were using one compiler across all these systems, overwhelmed the fact that the code produced by the GNU suite at that period of time was 30% less efficient than some commercial compilers. These days, the GNU compiler fairly proficient. They, they get within about 2 to 3% of a commercial compiler. And that's good enough. Because if your, if your machine is not fast enough using the GNU compilers, just buy a faster machine. It's cheaper. And in the 1980s and 1990s, other free software started to come about. BSD became more free. They fought a, a, a battle with AT&T. And it took a long time for them to be able to be license free from AT&T, but they eventually got it. But in the meantime, other major pieces of software, like SendMail, Bind, and Postgres, were coming out and people were using it and finding out of the quality of this software. Some of them came from MIT, some of them came from Berkeley, some of them came from just other projects. Now we get up to about 1991. 
And in 1991, there was a huge amount of free software available. You could get this software on DVDs from people who just accumulated this, like Walnut Creek or other people who made distributions of this free software that you could get to work on all these different operating systems because that was Richard Stallman's strategy. He knew that if he tried to write the kernel first in 1984, that by the time he had a complete operating system, his kernel would be obsolete. He wouldn't have had anything to run on that new kernel. He just would have had the kernel. So instead, he wrote software that ran across a whole range of different operating systems, in effect, creating a platform that a person could take their tools and be, use the same commands across all these operating systems. And by 1991, all of that was done, and there was one part that was really missing, and that was the kernel. And that was when a university student in Helsinki, Finland said, I'd like to create an operating system just for fun. It's not going to be big and important like, like, like you know, Xenix or, or you know, all these others. It's just going to be my own little project just for fun. Who would like to do this with me? Minix. That was the one I was looking for. Andy Tannenbaum's Minix. I love Andy. I wish he'd go away. <laughs> in any case, he said, okay, and, and this student had also got a brand new 386 processor. Why is that important? Anybody have an idea? Why is a 386, the fact that Linus had got a brand new 386 for Christmas, why is that important? Because the 386 was the first Intel processor that actually handled demand page virtual memory. All the rest of them, the 286, the 186, and so forth, were at best swapping systems. And Linus knew that the 386 had this capability that Windows could not do because Windows was too busy supporting the 286, the 186, and all these swapping only pieces of hardware. They were not going to take advantage of demand page virtual memory. Remember this fact for later. So he decided to write this new operating system. He looked around first. Could I use Go? Too expensive. No source code. Could I use this? Could I use that? And he finally decided to write his own. And let's see what else. So he just started this project for fun. There we go. Now, he was a college student. He had this brand new 386. Oh, the, the OS that came with it didn't do it. I have it's two slides. I'm sorry. I, I screwed up there. So about a couple years later, 1993 to 1994, distributions of Linux started. They took all the GNU software, they took the Linux kernel, they started to put it together. This is when Linux was really only point, 0 0.9999. Why is that important? When you're developing a new operating system, you give it version levels. And it's a general thing in the field that anything less than 1.0 doesn't have all the functionality you really need to make it useful. When the developers create 1.0, that's the time they say, yep, you can use this for general use. And so in 1993, Linux was still 0 0.9999. He just kept adding nines as you get closer and closer. And some of the operating systems, like Soft Landing Systems, SOS, came out. Yggdrasil. Very interesting little operating system, little distribution. Transameritech, the Slackware. Today, the only one of those that still exists is Slackware. Patrick Volkering, one of the gentlemen, the true gentlemen of open source. And in early 1994, Linus finally released version 1.0. And this allowed other operating systems to come in, Debian and a fledgling Red Hat, where there were only three college students who were creating the Red Hat distribution. Now, in May of 1994, 
I had a friend of mine from Decus. Remember Decus? I was still a member of Decus. I've been a member of Decus ever since 1969, but now I was working for Digital Equipment Corporation in their Unix group. And we were just developing a new version of Unix called DEC OSF1 that was based on OSF, the Open Software Foundation, which I told you about before, and the Alpha processor, the world's fastest 64-bit microprocessor. And Kurt Riesler was the, mem was the chairman of a Unix special interest group inside of DECUS. Inside of DECUS, we had special interest groups for hardware, networking, different operating systems, and so forth. Kurt was the chairman of Unisig. And he started sending these email messages to people all around the world saying, hi, we would like to bring this person from Europe to DECUS in New Orleans, and we can't really afford that. Could you lend us some money to do that? And they would write back, and they would say, I'm sorry, we're just a small company. We don't have any money, but we'll give you some CDs for your users. And Kurt would always copy me on these, and I didn't know why. But after a while, I felt sorry for him, and I went to my management, and I said, I don't know who this person is, and I don't know what he did, but Kurt, often has good ideas, and I think we should fund this. And then my management went to their management and said, I don't know what, who this guy is, I don't know what he did, and we don't know who Kurt is, but Mad Dog sometimes has good ideas, and I think we should fund this. So we got about 5,000 US dollars, and we bought the tickets for this person, and we bought a hotel room, and they were headed towards Dicus in New Orleans, and then Kurt asked the unforgivable. He said, we need an Intel PC to run this software on. I said, Kurt, my group does not sell Intel PCs. We sell real computer systems. We sell VAX computer systems. We sell MIPS computer systems. We sell Alpha computer systems. We don't sell weak, miserable, crappy Intel PCs. And Kurt says, well, I really need one for this software. So I had to go back to my management again, say we need to get a PC down, got a PC down there. I got on the plane and I flew to New Orleans. Now in the United States, there were two adult Disneylands. One of them is Las Vegas. Oh yeah, go there, Sin City. And the other one, lesser known, but just as great, is New Orleans. And you would love New Orleans. They got great jazz, they've got great food, they have carnival. They call it something else, but it's carnival. And you can get anything you want in New Orleans and a lot of things you don't want. But we were having our meeting and I love this city. So we went down there and I, I, I saw Kurt and he was trying to install this software in a weak, miserable, crappy Intel PC that I'd given him. And he couldn't do it. And along came this young guy, sandy brown hair, wire rim glasses, wearing sandals with wool socks. And he said in this lilting European accent in perfect English, may I help you? And Kurt looks at him and smiles and says, yes, I think you can. And 10 minutes later, Linus Torvalds had installed Linux on that weak, miserable, crappy Intel PC. This is the first time that Linus had ever installed Linux off of a CD-ROM. Because the way that Linus installed Linux was he would take and build the distribution on his second disk drive, then boot his second disk drive to install it on his first disk drive. That's the way he installed Linux. And so they then invited me down to sit and play on this system. And I started to sit down. And remember, this is a weak, miserable, crappy Intel PC. I started to use it. How many of you play piano or organ or some other keyboard? Yeah. You know that when you play even the crappiest piano, if it's well-tuned, you can usually get some fairly good sound out of it. But when you play a really great piano, 
one with all the keys perfectly weighted and all the right stuff. It's just a joy to play. Your fingers fly across it. That was what it was like with that early version of Linux. If I thought of it as System 5, it was System 5. If I thought of it as Berkeley, it was Berkeley. And it was so responsive and so snappy on this weak, miserable, crappy Intel, 32-bit Intel PC. I was amazed. And Linus was going to give two talks that day about his little project. He went to one talk, and you know, he was so he was so nervous. He was breaking out in sweat. And he said, I think I'm gonna vomit. And said, Linus, there's only like 40 people in the room. Yeah, I know, I know. If it was five people, I'm still gonna. But he managed to get through that. And then I took him out on that boat, the Natchez, the river boat. We go up and down the river, Mississippi River, listening to jazz and drinking these drinks called hurricanes. The reason that they're called hurricanes is because they're so strong, you drink two of them, it feels like you've been hit by Katrina. <laughs> and we're going down the river, we're going down the river, and we're standing up on the bow of the boat, and I turned to him and said, Linus, um, have you ever thought about porting Linux to a 64-bit computer, like the Alpha, and a RISC computer to get all the Intelisms out of the kernel? Now, I have to explain Intelisms. As I said before, if you write an operating system to a specific architecture, a lot of times you take shortcuts to, in order to take advantage of that architecture. But those shortcuts make it less, response, less, less easy to port to a new system. And I wanted to see Linux, I wanted to use Linux for research in 64-bit problems. And I saw it as the perfect answer because if you did that research, you could then exchange your source code with other researchers to make your research go faster and better. And Leah said to me, yes, I have thought about doing that. I've contacted the DEC office in Helsinki, and they're having problems getting me an alpha, so I may have to do the IBM PowerPC instead. Ah! I dropped my hurricane on the, on the boat, and I never drop a drink. And I said, don't do anything rash, because you know, just give me a day or two. And I went back to my office in New Hampshire, Digital Equipment Corporation, and I called up a friend. Now, a lot of people, you would think that if you're doing some type of work and stuff, you write a white paper, and you give it to your management, and they carefully consider it. And then they find it in the budget, and then they get you the money, and so forth and so on. But I didn't have that type of time. So I did the, the real way you do things in industry. You call in favors. And I had been at Digital Equipment Corporation for 16 years, and I had a lot of favors to call in, and I started calling them in. And I called up this guy named Jim Jackson, and I said, Jim, I need an alpha system sent to Helsinki, Finland right away. I don't have the time to tell you who it is and what it's for. What can you do for me? Now, I'm going to tell you, this is not a $400 system. This is not a $2,000 system. This is a 30 thousand dollar system in 1994 that I'm asking this guy to send to Helsinki, Finland for something he does nothing about. What can you do for me? Well, I just so happened to have one. And he told me what it was. I said, yep, 21 inch monitor, 3D graphics manual, 3D graphics manual. And, you know, all these other things that you're going to laugh, 96 megabytes of main memory. $30,000. I said, that'll do. You throw in a six millimeter tape drive, a four millimeter tape drive to do backups, you got a deal. He's laughing. He says, what are you going to pay for? I'll pay for shipping. The next day, it was on its way. And then I had to get Linus to sign a bunch of papers saying that eventually he probably would have to give this system back. And Linus, as he signed the papers, said, Will I ever really have to give this system back? I said, Linus, I've been at digital for 16 years. I've never seen any system come back with a loan of products. And so he signed it. And we were done. 
Unfortunately, as we shipped it, we didn't really do the paperwork right. And we said we were shipping it to Linus instead of shipping it to Digital Equipment Corporation and letting them give it to Linus. So when it hit customs, the Helsinki office had to pay $15,000 in taxes just to get this system to Linus. So then we did the Alpha Linux port. We started in January 2000 of, no, I'm sorry, that's, that's, that's wrong. We started January of uh, 1995, just a few months after I met Linus, and we had various people from the Linux community helping us with the port. Some people actually bought Alpha Systems to help us. In 1994, there was another problem that was happening. Supercomputer companies were going out of business. Cray, ECL, and others were going out of business. And yet we needed supercomputers. And so Linux was ported in a project known as Beowulf. And it created the supercomputer model. Today, of the 500 fastest computers in the world, all 500 run Linux. What types of problems are they solving? A whole range of problems necessary for human existence, including image rendering, the first movie to really use image rendering to a big scale was the Titanic. It was done by a company called Digital Domain that used 160 alpha processors to render the Titanic over a one year period of time. During the daytime, they ran Windows NT on it so they could do their editing and stuff, but at night, there's 160 systems were used as a Beowulf system to do the rendering. And then, of course, there's Blender. I'm just throwing in a, a, a word for them. Now, in 1996, I actually came to Brazil for the first time, and I went to the University of Sao Paulo, and I saw the most amazing thing, a university with 100,000 students, 16,000 PhDs, and they were using Linux there to do real-time Toy Story 1 quality rendering. Normally, Toy Story 1 would be rendered over a period of time, just like the Titanic was. The university was doing the rendering in real time. Amazing. They had shortened the time to evaluate a mammogram for cancer from 20 hours to 10 minutes using a Beowulf system and Linux. And people were creating workstation farms out of you know, relatively useless computers doing real scientific supercomputing work. Linus moved from Helsinki, Finland to Silicon Valley, worked for a company called Transmeta, but still continued to do his work on the Linux kernel. I started traveling, talking about Linux. Ironically, one of the first places I traveled to was Helsinki, Finland, because they wanted to have a, a seminar about Linux, but Linus had already moved. So they chose me instead. I started going around the world. I went to the University of the South Pacific in Fiji. They wanted to use Linux, but their tie-in to the internet was one 1,200 bit per second modem. As they tried to bring the operating system over the internet, there'd be a storm in the South Pacific. The internet would drop, and they would lose it. So I gave them a CD of Linux. And when I went back two years later, Everything in the university had been converted to Linux. I felt a little like this. <laughs> in September of 1998, the database is ported. If you bring out an operating system, there's a series of things that happen. And one of the first things that happen is that the database engines port to your operating system and architecture. Later on, uh, other companies started to support Linux. And in 2000, embedded systems started to use Linux. Why? Because embedded systems, for the first time, were converting and attaching to this thing called the Internet. And they needed security, and they needed a good networking stack, and they were using all these weirdo processors, which meant that they had to take their proprietary systems and port them, and that was a lot of work. Instead, 
they could use this little operating system that already supported all of those architectures, already had a network stack, already was secure, and it was called Linux. And in one year, the embedded systems people said, made Linux the most used operating system in new designs for embedded systems. By the way, Cyclades, a company right here in Brazil, was one of the first ones to embed Linux in networking hardware. And there's a series of other little embedded systems. A Linux watch, little server systems the size of a quarter. In March of 2000, the dot-coms failed. And in winter of 2003, at the same time, more or less, Red Hat actually became profitable. In Curitiba, Brazil, a high school that had nothing, no computer lab or anything, went out, got a whole series of computers, took them apart, put them together, put Linux on it, and created their own laboratory. And the, and the students learned three times what a computer was like, how to really configure it, and how to have pride in what they had done. So Linux is now coming of age. And we've, off of that, we've had other things like free culture, creative commons, open hardware in the Arduino and other systems. Caninas Lucas, which is happening here in Brazil, and this summer we'll be producing computers designed here in Brazil, manufactured here in Brazil, and I hope that you'll support them here in Brazil. And so today, 100% of the top supercomputers are running Linux, half of all the server systems in the world, and we're outselling Apple on the desktop, and we're outselling Android is outselling iOS on the phones. The future? I said this back in 2011, that Nokia was going to give up on Windows and use Android. I was ahead of my time. <laughs> Project Kawa, this is a this is estimate of the future. Project Kawa may reach its one millionth professional using free software, creating one million jobs. That's what I want to see happen. In 2015, Balmer admits he's been using Linux all along. 2020, the newest GNU Linux supercomputer has one trillion processors. And if they had to use a proprietary operating system, it would have cost a huge amount of money more, $35 trillion more. Lita admits he got rid of the, he's glad he got rid of the large uh, kernel lock. And then Steve Jobs says that OS X was not used because they were holding their computer wrong. 2030, software powers, patents are ruled invalid around the world, as they should be. They were really stupid, the US justice system admits. And the Microsoft and Apple wars end because both companies are out of business. And free software wins. Linus Torvalds retires. He comes to join me in, a, in an enterprise which I'm calling MMM plus BS, which stands for Mad Dogs Monastery and Marina of Math, Music, Microcomputing, Microbrewing, Microwinery, Microdistillery, and Bait Shop. Because if you have a marina, you need a bait shop. And this is a real business plan. This is not funny. This is not a joke. I am going to be creating this. And we are going to drive free software to its logical end. And in 2060, free culture brings world peace. And so I'd like to thank the Linux community on behalf of a lot of projects, millions of projects around the world that benefit from the free software that the Linux community makes, the open source community makes. And remember, if you want to see the most important person in free software, when you get up in the morning, take a look in the mirror. And now, as I close, I have an assignment for you. Next year is the half century of Unix, the internet, and my beard. <laughs> it is the quarter century of version 1.0 of the Linux kernel, Bayo of supercomputers, and a variety of other things, Alpha Linux. And so I have an assignment for you. Beastly is back. And next year, each one of you have to bring two Windows users to Beastly. 
so they can see what a great system and a great community we have. And you have to go out and talk to sponsors to get them to sponsor Feastly so we can be even better and bigger than before. Thank you very much.